Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, and if you're new to my channel, whether you just stumbled across this video at random or you're coming from Joshua's channel, hello, my name is Gabby, and welcome. I don't really do many collabs on my channel, but today's video is going to be a collab for Joshua's Summer of True Crime collab series. He came up with this absolutely brilliant idea to just have a bunch of collabs with true crime YouTubers. It's a way for you guys to discover some amazing true crime YouTubers that you've maybe never stumbled across, and also a way for us to kind of spread the word about these cases even more. It's just seriously an awesome idea, Joshua. It's a great idea and I commend you for that. So if you guys just want a summer of really interesting videos and cases that make you think a lot, cases that you're going to dive into even when the video is over, definitely check out all the YouTubers linked down below in the description of this video. And with all that being said, let's get right into it. This is the unsolved disappearance of Lori Lynn Partridge. Laura Lynn Partridge, who preferred to be called Lori, so that's what I'll be calling her for the remainder of this video, was born May 13th, 1957 in Santa Monica, Florida. She was the oldest of six children and her family moved to Spokane, Washington in 1974 from Fountain Valley. She was 17 years old at the time of her disappearance. She had dirty blonde hair and blue eyes. She weighed about 110 pounds and stood at five feet tall. A distinct physical characteristic of hers was that she had a mole on her right cheek. At the time of her disappearance, she was said to be wearing a long hooded navy blue coat, a tan sweater, tan plaid pants, and blue denim shoes with crepe soles. She was also said to be carrying a brown leather purse with a braided shoulder strap that had a blue flower on it. Lori attended Joel E. Ferris High School, where she was a member of the drill team and wrote on the school newspaper. She also loved to play her guitar and sing, often playing music for her younger siblings and kids in the neighborhood. Even though she was still a teenager though, she was engaged. She and her fiance were very happy and they had a really good and solid relationship together. They planned on moving in together at his family farm and taking care of the animals and starting a family. They both adored children, so it was something they were both very much looking forward to. They were also both looking forward to picking out engagement rings together on the 5th of December, but they never got to it because she disappeared just the day before. Around 12.30 p.m. on December the 4th, 1974, Lori left school early because she was suffering with severe menstrual cramps. So Lori called her parents and asked them whether they could come pick her up from school and take her home. However, neither of her parents were able to do that. Her parents just told her to wait for the bus and get the bus home. Lori, though, decided for some reason to not wait for the bus. Maybe she didn't have enough money for the bus and decided to walk the two miles back to her home. She also thought maybe the walk could help the cramps subside. That night she failed to show up to work or back home. Her family reported her missing and just like so many other cases I have talked about, police originally classified her as a runaway, even though her family knew she would never run away. This was a young girl who showed zero signs of being unhappy in life. She had a fiance she was going to be picking out engagement rings with the next day. She just had a lot in life that she was looking forward to. She simply decided to walk home that day and something happened along the way. After her parents realized the police were probably not going to help very much at this time, her father and second oldest child decided to follow the path she would have walked. They knocked on every person's door and asked them if they had seen Laurie the day she went missing. This is the path that she would have taken that day from her school to her home on Costa Road and the blue area, Havana Street between 43rd and 49th was the last area she was seen. They pretty much built an exact timeline and pinpointed around the time she would have disappeared just based on people's accounts. The public was informed at one time that Lori's purse had been found, but that was actually false information because her purse has never been located. But this is where this case gets an even bigger twist. Inside Lori's purse were two general admission tickets to go see the Beach Boys on December 9th at the Spokane Coliseum. These tickets were bought by her father. Her family was very smart when it came to her disappearance. 
They were very strategic. They knew the ticket numbers of Lori's tickets she bought since her father was the one who purchased them. And they asked police if there was any way that they could check ticket numbers of the people coming into the concert that night. Chances are the abductor wouldn't have gone himself to the concert, but he most likely would have sold the tickets to someone else for money. And maybe they could have tracked down the abductor from whoever used the tickets that night. Police though refused to let them do that, but a couple officers did go to the concert and check around the crowd to see if Lori herself was anywhere that night. Every ticket that was purchased for the concert that night was used, which means Lori's tickets were used that night. Lori's mother actually had both ticket numbers written down. If the police just checked every ticket's numbers, then they would have likely been able to track how a ticket from a missing girl's purse ended up in somebody else's hands five days after that girl went missing. They did the bare minimum, which was to simply go and look and see if Lori was there. I don't even understand why they thought Lori would be there in the first place, because they seem pretty set on the fact that she had run away. Why? would somebody who was running away go to a concert in the area that she had run away from? That makes no sense to me. It makes no sense at all, um, in my mind, why the police did this. And it's just further to the, the police incompetence that happened in this case. When I think about the selling of the tickets, this was the 1970s. This is not in today's time. There was no internet for you to just sell the tickets. So these people who use the tickets most likely bought them directly from the abductor or somebody that the abductor knew. So the people who use the tickets could have given a description of who they bought them from or maybe they knew them personally. I mean, you never know. But if something was done about this lead, which this was the biggest lead in this case for the entire case, this case could have been solved back in 1974. Not long after that though, a girl came forward saying she may have possibly spotted Laurie the day she disappeared. She said that day, a little after 4pm, she was riding her horse when she spotted a man in his mid-40s with a girl that looked exactly like Laurie. She even described the clothes the girl was wearing and it fit the description of the clothing Laurie was wearing when she vanished. This girl stated that the man and the girl were standing in front of a white truck with a darker coloured door and the man was holding a rifle. It was near the route Laurie took that day, but she said when she turned back round, the girl that looked like Laurie was gone. After she saw Laurie's story on the local news that night, she decided to contact police about what she saw earlier that day. Now, police couldn't do much with this information, but they did start to receive a lot of reports of supposed sightings. Police received information that Laurie had possibly been followed by a green Ford Pinto station wagon. Someone came forward stating they actually saw the missing 17-year-old in the back of what was coincidentally described as a green Ford Pinto station wagon. Again, this lead went nowhere. They even looked into the possibility that the notorious Ted Bundy had actually been involved, but due to credit card receipts, it was determined that Ted had actually been in Utah at the time of her disappearance, and he even stated himself that he was not involved in her disappearance. They even questioned Stanley Burnson, someone responsible for taking the lives of many people in the area at that time. He was a traveling salesman who lived in Spokin, and even had a delivery route not far from when Laura was taken. He was questioned after it happened, and again in July of 2018, but he continues to deny any involvement. Like in any case, they start questioning the people closest to her, so the people that they started looking at first were her father and her fiancé. Pretty much within no time, it was determined that her father and her fiancé had nothing to do with her disappearance, and from my research, the both of them tried very hard to locate her or find out what happened to her. They followed lead after lead on their own, even traveling all the way to Idaho at one point. This case just seriously tore their entire family apart and it's it's just devastating to watch any family go through this, but they really did try and the police, if only they had listened to the parents, I mean, this case could have been solved and that's kind of what ate away at her entire family at the beginning. A previous case of mine that I covered on my channel, I talked about mother's intuition and that is also present in this case. The day that Lori went missing, before anyone even knew she was missing, Lori's mother was at work. Everything was fine and she randomly passed out. 
This was unlike her. She had never passed out before under any circumstances. When she came to, she looked terrified and told her coworkers that something happened to her daughter. She had a feeling something was very wrong. Lori's mother passed away in 2004 before she ever got to find out what happened to her daughter, and Lori's father, who is still alive today, fears the same thing will happen with him. He cannot even talk about his daughter even all these years later without crying. He hopes and prays to find out something before his life is over. Her family just wants this case to be solved and wants to give her a proper burial. They've come to the realization long ago that her life most likely ended not long after her abduction. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Lori Lynn Partridge, you are urged to call the Spocken Crime Check on 509-456-2233 or the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children at 1-800-843-5678 or the tip line at 509-242-TIPS. You can stay anonymous. This is a case with no crime scene, no real evidence, and no remains. There was really no leads for the investigating officers to go off. Now, there was actually a few people that the police suspected of being involved in Laurie's disappearance, but there was not enough evidence to actually directly link them, and there was nothing concrete that could uh, lead to any kind of charges or convictions. There was nothing more than simple suspicion. They did even question an ex of Laurie, but it was determined that he wasn't involved either. He wasn't a suspect. This case is 45 years old. When you think about it, in five more years, it's going to be half a century old. And this family is no closer to solving it than they were right after it happened. Their family has been told by so many people to just move on from it but like many other families, they absolutely refuse until there's some sort of conclusion. I did get most of my information regarding this case from a post that Lori's niece had put up online. From the research that I did, this case is very dry. There's just not a lot of information about it. I know there's very limited information, but definitely let me know your opinions down below in the comments, especially if you've researched this case as well. And of course, this is a collab, so definitely go check out Joshua's video. I will have that link down in the description. I mostly cover vintage cases on my channel, but the video that we did for his channel, he covers a more current one, and it's very, very interesting, so definitely go check out that video. Of course, go give Joshua a follow because he's going to have the entire collab series, tons of true crime collabs going up on his channel for the entire summer. I love you guys so much and I hope you all are having an amazing day and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.